Well, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about growing herbs and herbs in the landscape, and then Jane's going to talk about using herbs. So first we'll define what herbs are, and really herbs are any plant that's used for flavoring or fragrance or medicine or other domestic uses like repelling pests and dyes. And when we say, initially think of herbs as annuals and perennials, but when I say any plant, it could be a tree, a shrub, it could be a fern, a lichen, any plant. And when you know that, it's there are just so many herbs in the world. And it can be any part of the plant that's used. It can be the, the root, the leaves, the stem, the uh, flowers or the seeds that are used. And people always ask, well, what's the difference between an herb and a spice? Well, you see with this big definition of herbs that spices are really just a subset of herbs. Practically speaking, we usually think of plants where we use the seed or the root, um, um, the seed through the bark as spices, things like cinnamon and nutmeg, but and 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 those that we use the leaves are as 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 herbs. And we think of herbs as growing more in temperate. Uh, climates and, and spices is growing more in tropical uh, climates, but really it's a fuzzy concept because you think of a, a plant like cilantro, where you use the, seed, the leaves in flavoring, we consider that an herb, but its seed is coriander, which we consider a spice. So they're all herbs. Now, herbs have been used throughout history in all cultures. And in fact, even before written history, anthropologists have found cave drawings where uh, the Stone Age people were using herbs as medicine. The Chinese were the first to write about herbs 5,000 years ago. And the Greeks and Romans used herbs for healing them. The Egyptians use herbs as medicine and also for embalming. And there are herbs all over the Bible, you know, references to herbs. By the Middle Ages, they were being used to just about all the ways we know about today for healing or trying to heal the sick, for flavoring food or maybe covering up the flavors of food that, that um, weren't quite, were starting to spoil at times when they didn't have refrigeration. They use them for repelling insects. They use them for dyes. And, and that remained pretty much so. And when people came from the old world to the new world, they brought seeds and cuttings of those plants because they needed those to take care of their families. And but when they got here, they discovered that Native Americans were using plants that grew wild in the new world for also for healing and, and sometimes for flavoring food as well. So up until the time, well, World War II or so, and even later, like my grandmother used, she had her sage that she used for sausage and for, for dressing, but she also used sassafras. So she was using both European herbs and she was using native herbs. She had the sassafras that she made a toothbrush with and also stuck twigs in her dried apples to keep the bugs away. And around about, I guess at the end of World War II when people were living, were moving more to subdivisions, they had less land, they stopped cooking and stopped growing vegetable gardens. People stopped using herbs as much. And then about 15 to 20 years ago, that interest was renewed uh, a lot. And people discovered that 
herbs really con contribute so much to the flavor of food. And I think it's um, part of now, part of growing your own food, part of local growing, knowing where your food comes from, has made growing herbs more um, exciting for people. And, and I think it's, uh, people want to know where their food comes from. And fortunately for us, herbs are pretty easy to grow in this area. Even though we aren't the Mediterranean, where a lot of the culinary herbs come from, we still can grow these herbs if we give them what we need. And we will talk about all of the, um, these topics on growing herbs as we go along. Now, when you decide to grow herbs, the first thing you're going to consider really is the size. And you that has full sun. And by full sun, I mean at least six hours of sun. That sunlight helps the herbs to develop those essential oils that give them the strong flavors and fragrances. You can grow herbs in four to six hours of sun. They won't be quite as flavorful. There are a few herbs, and if you on your sheet, the one that um, has a sampler of herbs in the landscape, it has herbs for shade and you'll see there that it lists the ones that will take part shade or light shade that are culinary and then then some that are more ornamental um, but but parsley chervil chives coriander mint lemon balm lovage will take light shade so those if so if you don't have a lot of sun those you can you can try and part shade so while we can be a little bit flexible about the sun, almost none of the herbs like soil that's not well-drained. So you really, really, really need well-drained soil. And that can be a problem in our area since we have clay. And you know from your soils class that clay has real tight, small particles and, and sand of course has bigger particles what you want to do with your clay soil and actually if you had sandy soil this would work well too is to add organic matter so compost is the best thing you can do to add to your soil to help to make it drain and and most things not even herbs but especially or most things like well-drained soil so add add compost to your soil if you, if despite everything you do, you still don't have a good place in your yard for herbs that's well drained enough, you can always grow in in raised beds. Herbs do really well in raised beds or in containers. And I should say that that some herbs, and I'm thinking specifically of lavender, really, really, really like well drained soil so much so that people make people put extra rocks in the hole and uh, I know um, Jane Jane has used um, I, I can't think of the name of the um, of the product but it ha it's it's like the it's like when the the rock is Jane um, okay <laughs> we can't hear Jane right can you not hear me? Yeah, no, I do. So what? It's, it's called permatil, and it's expanded shale. It's been like heated till it sort of crush is crushed, and it really loosens the soil. So that's and, a used to help make it well drain. And you can also get something called dirty rock to put yes. in with your soil. And that's just as it comes from the um, the quarry before it's sorted. <laughs> yes. Now, 
this is not essential, but I would strongly recommend that you choose a site near your kitchen door for your herbs, especially your culinary herbs, because if you brush against those herbs as you're going in and out, if you, if you rub them as you pass, they're going to help inspire you to use those herbs. And if you don't have to go very far when that pot's on the stove or when you're getting ready to make dinner, you're much more likely to use them. So, so put them close by where, where they'll be close at hand. Joy? Yes. Someone asked if we could, if you could add sand. You could add sand, but if you just add sand and and clay, you're you're going to get something more like concrete. You really the thing about the compost is that it has these irregular sized particles, and so that just really really helps the drainage. Plus, you get some um, you know some nutrients from it too. I mean, compost is just great, so it's much better. You, you can use a little bit of, of, um, of sand. When, when you're choosing what kind of garden, our garden to have, when I started growing herbs probably 35 years ago, we saw all these neat little formal herb gardens. People don't do that much anymore. For one thing around here, we don't have that much flat land, <laughs> a lot of us. And, and those are a lot of work, they're, they're neat. But most, most people now are, are choosing to do more informal kinds of herb gardens and they mostly not even in a separate bed anymore. Mostly it's interspersed with um, the flowers and the vegetables. I, I grow, have, most of my herbs are just in with my flowers and I may put like the dill and the cilantro in with the, in with the vegetables where they have a little more room but there there are no set rules and lots and lots of people are growing herbs in containers that's one of the favorite ways to grow now and you can see lovely examples all over and once you realize how many things are herbs you'll see that they're just everywhere uh, i will say that when you're growing herbs in containers you don't want to just go out and dig up dirt out of your yard you need to put in a soil mix so you'll have that drainage. Now, uh, Jason Reeves, who's a, and Melody's, who's director of the Util Trial Gardens in Jackson, who do, does hundreds of pots every year, has a, a tip for people he spoke to Saps, he's spoken several times, but one of his tips the last time he was here was that for these containers, he, he does use 10% garden soil and 90% and soil mix. The reason for that, he said, is because they retain water just a little bit better than if you just used entirely soil mix. So I've been doing that lately. I don't use, I use a good quality soil mix that's got peat and perlite. I don't use miracle Grow because I want to control um, the fertilization because um, herbs don't need much fertilizer. And, and I, don't, I, get, I get big bags of soil mix from um, Mize and lately uh, they've changed brands. so. I don't have a concrete brand to recommend to you right now, um, but but do, it's it's worth buying the quality swim mix. Can we clarify something yes. um, that was said a little bit uh, a few minutes ago? Uh, someone just wants to clarify: was it permatil and dirty rock? What you had said, Jane? Yes. Okay, and um, someone is asking uh, to clarify what dirty rock is because they've never heard of it. Uh, Dirty rock is like, it's like gravel, but it has soil in with it. And I've actually seen bags of it at Lowe's called 
Tennessee rock. <laughs> and it's like a, maybe an inch around, little gravelly like pieces and you just mix it in. But if you go to a quarry, you can ask them for dirty rock and they'll have it. Interesting, thank you. And the permatil you can get it most of the time at like a Southern States or a farm store, but you, ha you may have to get them to order it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. I have a, another question. Is that just to fill in the extra space in the pot or is that just for drainage? The dirty rock or the permatil is mainly used in with your clay soil to okay. loosen it and make for dra good drainage. I Got use it. it in my lavender because I have okay. trouble with lavender. Lavender's lavender's one that's especially uh, hard to do, and, and that's that's one that most people use ex extra steps to, for good drainage. Thank you, Jane. Uh, the next, once you've figured out what your side is, um, then you're ready to choose your plants. And, and deciding what to grow is an entirely personal thing. I would suggest starting small with just eight or 10 plants if you're not growing herbs already. Uh, and, and choose things that your family will like. For example, there are people who really don't like cilantro. In fact, there's a an I hate cilantro website. So if your family doesn't like cilantro, <laughs> um, you don't want to grow that one, even though that's on that's on your sheet uh, of the the twelve top herbs. So pick pick ones your family like, and and those those that I put on the sheet are are um, some you want might want to start with. But then once you are, get going, there are really some wonderful ones to, to branch out and try. One of the ones I've, I've enjoyed this spring while we're staying at home is, is garden sorrel uh, that I've been able to just go, you know, pick the leaves and put them in my salad, or, or you can also make it, use it in soup, but that's a fun one to have this time of year. And another, uh, another favorite um, is lemon verbena, which uh, uh, is my favorite lemon herb. And it's, uh, it's not hardy, but I bring it in every year. But it's a wonderful herb. So you can branch out once you start, but the, 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 those on that handouts for the 12 top herbs are some that I, most people like to start with. And, and there are lots of, you'll see lots of recipes that use those. Like, like any herbaceous plants, you'll find that some are annuals. The, um, the main annual herbs um, that I grow are basil and dill and cilantro. Parsley is a biennial, meaning that it, it starts, you start it from seed one year, it, it grows, it overwinters. The second year, it will make, um, it will bloom and make seeds, and then it dies. Now, perennials, you know, will will grow for several years. Some are long-lived and some are short-lived. But the, the, I think I on that sheet I mentioned those which the which herbs are annuals and which are perennials, and lots and lots of herbs are are perennials. So so you can get long life out of them. You can get plants by starting from seed or by buying plants. And, and this year we're all sad because we can't go to plant sales, but, and I know that the, you had to cancel your master gardener plant sale and we had to cancel the spring garden fair at exchange place. So we were very sad about that. But I had seeds at home, so I don't know. Can you see my little little tiny basil plants? <laughs> and some things are really easy to start from seed. Basil is one of the things that's really easy to start from seed. And and I like to have quite a few basil plants, so it's a, it's a good one to start from seed. And sometimes you want to start another you might plant basil now, but you would start 
another crop again in oh six weeks or two months so that you'd have some younger plants coming on. I do that sometimes. Uh, sage, chives are really easy to start from seed, but you may not want, you know, that many chive plants. So you can share with a friend or, or I have lots of seeds in my refrigerator from year to year from if, uh, if I don't need them all right then. Two plants that, two herbs that you want to start from seed and you want to plant them where they're going to stay are cilantro and dill. I don't know if you can see these. I don't know if it shows up well or not. But cilantro and dill don't like to be moved once they're planted. They don't like their roots disturbed. So you need to plant those where they're but from seed where they're going to be staying. Now I buy lots of plants from time to time and and sometimes you just want one or two plants so it's easier to just buy that rather than starting the seed but some things are hard to start from seed some things don't make seed dependably or they are not true to seed so those you'll definitely want to uh, buy the plants, things like the lemon verbena, you need to buy the plant. Uh, scented geraniums, um, sometimes rosemary is hard to start from seed, sometimes parsley is hard to start from seed. Um, I've got the, you know, I, I would buy a bay, uh, so, so, so some things you want to have start, you want to buy the plant. If you want a particular cultivar, suppose there's a special kind of rosemary that's a little hardier, you, you need to buy the plant. Uh, if, if you want one of the, the variegated um, sages, you need to buy the plant. Once you have plants, some of the herbs are, are easy to, to propagate. Um, you can, I divide my chives all the time. We were talking about that. Uh, oregano is easy to divide. Um, you can also layer some herbs, chives, some of the, especially the creeping, not chives, uh, thyme. Some of the thymes layer really, really well. And a lot of things are pretty easy to start from cuttings. Um, rosemary is pretty easy to start from cuttings. Um, the basils and uh, are so easy to start from cuttings that a lot of times when I take a, a, a little cutting in water to a master gardener class, if I have it, if I just leave it in the water, it'll, it'll make roots and I have a cutting already. Oh, wow. So there, there are lots of things to get. Um, herbs. Joy, we have a question. Yes. Um, if you plant several herbs in a small plot, how much spacing do you need between them? Can they be crowded? Do they prefer crowded or do they need air? How do they, how do you plant them effectively? Um, if I'm planting them in, in the garden, I would, I would, <coughs> allow 18 inches to two feet between them. In general, plants are healthier if they have some good air circulation, you just don't have as much trouble with diseases. It, but in pots, you know, you can get by with having, having them closer, but they're not necessarily there. Some of them are only there for a season. Um, but I, but I do in general, you know, think it's a good idea to have good air circulation, especially out if you're outside in the ground. In in pots, well, go talk, we we're going to talk about it later. But in pots, you also want to think about grouping things that have the same needs, that have the same, and that's true not just of herbs, but any any plants you put together in pots, same light needs, same water needs. 
um, I would, and in a pot I would put things, you need to always think about the, the uh, size it's going to eventually get to, not just the little tiny size it is when you put it in, maybe. <clears throat> uh, the next slide we talk about, we're talking about planting. For a lot of perennial herbs, once they are hardened off, you can go ahead and plant them. Oh, first of April, they'd be just fine. The real, the real thing you have to is your basil. What you want to remember about basil is think of basil like you think about tomatoes. They really don't. They don't like it below fifty. So you want to wait till the night times temperatures are going to be dependably around, not much below 50. Um, they suffer below 50, they really, they pretty much die below 40. So you, know, you don't want them out over 40. But when you're, when you're, when you're getting ready to plant, um, you prepare the site just like you would like if you're doing it in the vegetable garden where you're going to broadcast seed, you just get rid of the, you get rid of the weeds and then you, I just, for, for cilantro and dill, I just kind of rough up the ground and spread those. But for other things where I'm going to plant plant, I, I just uh, weed that area if I need to and then plant it like you would when if you're sawing any other perennial. You want to dig a hole that's about as deep as as, as the pot you're going to put it in. I generally add a, a shovel full of compost for good measure. And um, you want to plant it at the the same depth it is in the pot. If if you take it out of the pot and the the Roots are all tangled up. If, if, if it's kind of root bound, you want to pull those roots apart and, and so it can grow. If they're just going round and round and round, they'll just act like they're in a pot still. So, so separate those roots and get them so that they can take up moisture. And I just kind of firm it with my hands then and, and be sure and label the plants. But you'll forget. For you, you want to water it in really good when you plant it, and then, then water. I usually I water good when I plant it. I'll usually water once or twice good that next that that same week, and then maybe once the next week, and and taper off. In general, herbs should get about an hour, I mean, an inch of, of water a week. Uh, and it's, some things, once they're established, are really, some herbs are pretty drought tolerant. But the basils and the dill, may, the, the annual ones may need a little more water if it's droughty time. But in general, uh, uh, about an inch a week. I will say for for pots, you know, it's a whole different ball game because you just kind of have to watch your, your things in containers because they can, if they're in sun, they can rot really, really fast. But whether you're whether you're watering in the ground or in a pot, you always want to water thoroughly. None of this, you know, quarter of a <laughs> cup on it, water until it comes out. And if it's dried out, you may want to water it and then wait a half an hour till that peat's kind of woken up and water it again so that you get it really watered well. And um but 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 you water you water well when you water. I I mulch my gray herbs, you'll see on the photo, the, the gray herbs, the herbs like 
lavender and rosemary and sage with um, those granite chips, or you can also use pea gravel. I like that better for them than using any kind of an organic mulch. Uh, if you use, you know, wood chips or if you use uh, shredded leaves, you want to always make sure, not only for herbs, but for any kind of perennials, that that those that that mulch is not up against the stem of the plant because that can cause rot. So you want to make sure it's out. But the thing that the crushed granite or the pea gravel does is that it not only acts as a mulch and helps keep uh, the weeds down, but it also keeps or organic matter debris from splashing up on the plant. So that can help with uh, keeping um, this help with disease prevention. Joy, we have a question. Um, someone is asking about if plants do well um, in if herbs do well in self-watering containers. I don't know, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, I mean, some of them might do just fine. Um, things like rosemary in containers are a little bit trickier. They they kind of like to almost dry out, but not quite. And that's sort of. Um, but the thing the thing is, if you've got well drained soil, if and if you've got a well drained potting mix, that can be a it's it's really forgiving. So, um, if if you've got the if if you're well drained, you can get battled with a lot of things. But I guess I I'm not I've never used self watering containers. Maybe I should. <laughs> um, fertilizing um, herbs is not generally recommended except for compost in the ground. Uh, and compost will give you every bit you need to fertilize herbs a lot because they have less flavor. They have um, they have less flavor and fragrance if they have, you know, a watery, leafy, fast growing. So you want them to be, you want the ground just to be a little bit lean so that, so that those flavors are more intense. And um, in a pot though, those herbs can't, those roots can't go out and get the nourishment. So in a pot, you do need to supply some kind of, of fertilizer, but you want it to be half strength. And you can use, um, I don't know if you can see this, this is Osmocote. You can use one of the time release fertilizers, half strength. You can use uh, you know, one of the liquid fertilizers. Um, I've also got some fish emulsion back here. Um, you might want to use that. Um, I've also mixed in alfalfa meal sometimes. That's a slow, long, um, it's, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a time, long-term thing. So I'm gonna boost right away. But you do, you do need to, to weekly fer, um, fertilize your, um, of herbs that are in pots. I don't know if any of Ann God of Ann's greenhouse, she used to say, and she did this for everything. She would say she fertilized weekly, W-E-E-K-L-Y, weekly, W-E-A-K-L-Y. Uh, uh, Joy, we have another question. Um, I, I have the same problem. Jerry is asking this too. Uh, my rosemary is getting very lanky. Is it too late to trim it back and how much should it be trimmed back? Get into that, okay. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, um, 
the things that are going to be the biggest trouble as far as spreading is is mints usually those those are some of the, the mints and the lemon bombs the mints people often uh, grow in containers so they don't have to worry or in an area where it's got a natural boundary like a sidewalk we can control it that way so i've seen also people even immerse um, a plastic pot in the ground and, and put mints in that sometimes they'll even manage to get out with that but that can help with controlling mint um, other things that are a problem are are the um the garlic chives <laughs> and and some other things that spread seeds so um uh enthusiastically and for, for that the best thing to do is just cut off those seed heads those blossoms once they're spent before they uh, before they uh, form seeds herbs don't have many pests and diseases and that along with the fact that they don't need much fertilizer means that they're really good candidate for growing organically in fact i grow all of mine organically um, however after i said they don't have any pests and diseases i'm going to show you this is a pest on um, this four line plant bug and the mature um on the left side of your screen is the four lane plant bug and on the right is the nymph right now in my house right outside the door i've got the red nymphs and um they make they make these little about 16th of an inch you can see some of the pattern of course this is enlarged on the on the leaf there that you're sucking and they they uh i had the question one reason i wanted to show you this is because this is a question i've gotten before uh, what's on my mint and they're these four land plant bugs attack a lot of of different plants but they really like things in the mint family they um what they feed and then they lay their eggs and then they're gone and so usually what i do is nothing and in six weeks i can just cut off that ugly part um, you can you can try to clean up debris afterwards and, and keep them down uh, without using chemicals um, and i don't like to but you may see these that's not uncommon now we're going to talk about harvesting and pruning um, herbs like to be pruned and harvesting is a way of pruning and and when you think when you uh harvest your um herbs for use you need to think about how you know think about it looking good i don't know i've got a rosemary here anytime you harvest you can you see it i'm not sure if i you want to cut above a node you don't want to just strip the leaves but you want to cut above a leaf node so it can branch out and um my this this rosemary is lanky too my rule for the woody plants like the rosemaries and the sages is that i don't cut i only cut back where there's new growth underneath like if if i had if i had a woody stem and there was no new underneath i wouldn't cut back into that wood uh, but if i've got new growth coming out for it you can cut it and this is actually a good time to cut this is a good time to prune most herbs especially the woody ones benefit from being pruned 
if they get too woody, then they'll they'll get weaker and eventually die. It's it's rejuvenating for them to be pruned. Um, but you know, if if it if there's not, I wouldn't go so you know I wouldn't prune way back if there's not any growth coming out below. But I could take this all down where I've got something coming out. Um, in general, they tell you not to take more than a third off at a time, but I could I could do these, you know, the three, I could do the biggest ones and then come back and do in a couple of weeks to do the others. It's a different case with things like uh, um, basil. I mean, they can, basil can really be pruned a lot. Uh, one of the writers who used to write for uh, Herb Companion, uh, and, and she's written several books, Susan Belsinger said that she could get 15 to 25 cups of basil off of one plant. And she starts when it just has like about four sets of leaves and she, she will prune it down to that, that first set of true leaves and let it go. And then she keeps every four weeks or so cutting it back hard, hard again. And it keeps it from going to seed I mean, flowering and um, it kind of changes the taste once it flowers. So you want to keep it. So she's she getting all this basil off. Um, uh, from just one one plant. But um, I did want to say for for um, harvesting chives. Uh, Joy, can we go back to basil for a second, please? We have a question about basil. Someone wants to, um, to know how you get bushy, big bushy basil plants. Okay, you get it big and bushy by pruning hard. Um, let's see. This, this one, this is a little tiny one. I don't know if you can, can see it. Eddie, it's been pruned once already and you could at this point you could also maybe you let it grow just a little more but then that that could come out you know each one of these where it's where it's where the um, where it's already branched out you could prune it again and you're gonna have four so so by getting like by pruning a lot you can get it to branch out This actually is an African blue basil, and you'll see pictures of it. Uh, again, it's not a culinary basil. It's a really pretty decorative basil. But but mine will get really big. Mine will be two, two and a half feet sometimes, if depending on weather. <clears throat> uh, I was going to say for, for chives, when I prune chives, I prune them all the way back to the ground. To the base of the plant because otherwise if you just take the tips you'll get a little brown um, place where you've cut so it just it, grooming it looks nicer to do that if you're pruning you're harvesting um, parsley you want to go back to the ground and harvest the whole stem but also do it on the outside because it grows from the inside. So as long as your insides, you want to leave your inside to grow. <clears throat> now herbs, um, we, we, we want our herbs to survive and most of them will do fine if you have healthy plants to, to start with. And if you've given them that well-drained soil, starting with a healthy plant and having well-drained soil is, is the most important thing to remember. And um, I also usually end up leaving the top parts, you know, the, the, the dead branches, that seems to help a little bit. 
also you want to not fertilize, which I wasn't gonna fertilize anyway, but not prune um, it more than six weeks. I mean, closer than six weeks before the first frost. So say not after the first of September or so, because if you prune it thin, you get this lush um, new growth that's not gonna be as able to withstand the cold. But even then, there are some herbs that are not going to survive winter, and you're going to have to decide what to do with them. I don't have a good track record with rosemary in pots and in the ground, so I'm, all my rosemary is in pots. Um, any any um, tender perennial that I want to be sure I keep is in a pot like the lemon verbena, the uh, geraniums, the sun geraniums, the, um, my um, Spanish lavender, uh, the, the, the African blue basil, and the uh, Mexican bush sage. I always try to have bring because there've been some years I couldn't find those locally. And I bring in those all those tender perennials and the bay, <clears throat> and I have a list of I've made myself a list of things that can take it down to to 32 and things that can take it down to 20, and and I put them down on days when it's sunny, but otherwise they're in the window, and they're in the basement so they get it's, it's more moisture than upstairs, so they do pretty well there. But I don't fool with bringing in, you know, regular basil, except maybe just for a little bit of, you know, maybe November, December, because the basil won't be as flavorful in the winter as what I've gotten that I've frozen. Herbs are wonderful in the landscape and this, this is UT Gardens and that very first picture you saw was UT Gardens too. This was about 15 years ago, big beautiful rosemary. But you see how, what wonderful, and you're gonna see in this section, many, many things you may not have realized are herbs. Herbs are both useful and beautiful companions. We, um, we always get questions about companion planting with herbs because there's been a lot of um, of the traditional companion planting um, recommendations that had to do with herbs repelling pests. Now, now companion planting in general is a big topic, and and really means that one that one plant or two plants, three plants benefit in some way by being together, either by being more productive or by uh, in some way keeping pests away. And the, the whole, the whole, um, the whole companion planting as far as repelling pests is, is, is it's a mixed bag. Some of, some of it seems to really work and some of the traditional recommendations don't work. But um, it is true that, that insects depend on taste and smell and sight for feeding and by having diversity, by having a variety of things in your garden, um, that you may confuse them and, and have them not bother your vegetables so much. And so you certainly should experiment and see what works because you can have some level of protection by doing that. But what is we really, really do know is that herbs do attract the good guys. They attract, they, um, you know that most insects are not pests, less than 1% are plant pests. And so you want the beneficial insects in your garden. And the good guys are predators that, that either sting or, or grasp 
and eat the, the bad guys or they're parasitic flies or wasps like you see on the tomato hornworm or or the pollinators and these beneficials need food that's high in proteins of pollen and high sugar nectar they need plants with lots of nectar and protein and i mean nectar and pollen they they have the especially the predators and the parasite parasitic wasps and flies have small mouth parts and so they need small flowers and so herbs are wonderful for that and the the two of the best groups are the the carrot family the parsley family and that's got dill cilantro lovage fennel parsley all those with the little umbrella like flowers and they are wonderful because each of their little flowers has just about the most nectar of any plant but they don't bloom very long the sunflower family on the other hand doesn't have each one of their little flowers and you know the flowers are the little tiny things in the middle not the petals on the outside <clears throat> each of their little flowers have a lot of nectar not as much as the carrot family but they're bloom over a much longer period of time and the sunflower family is aster family is huge it's 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 all those daisy like plants the asters the sunflowers it, it's tansy it's it's chamomile yarrow artemisia it's some things you probably don't realize like goldenrod are also in that family it's an absolutely huge family and all those are considered herbs but the mints, and when I say mint family, the lots of herbs are in the mint family. The rosemary, basil, thyme, lavender, all in the mint family. And the mustard, borage, and mullins are also great for beneficials. And some of the beneficials are really good for leaving those stems because they can overwinter the, the uh, beneficial parasitic wasps and other beneficials can can overwinter in their stems. So it's good to leave those stems for that reason too. And herbs are, so many pollinators on herbs. Herbs love, so many bees love herbs. And see all of these um, butterflies on, on herbs. Bumblebees. Some herbs are superfoods too. The um, this the two you just saw, the anisysa, the um, the aster are superfoods. Superfoods are those herbs, uh, those plants that have nectar that's high in amino acids in addition to the, the sugary things, so that they can be a, 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 a protein replacement for, for pollen. They can act like the pollen does for, for them. So, so they're especially good plants in the garden and for, for the pollinators and other beneficial insects. But uh, anisysa, the um, asters, uh, bee balm, joe pie weed, uh, bone set, the perennial sunflowers, uh, goldenrod are all considered uh, to have this, the superfood nectar. And this is on your left is the African blue basil and on your right um, uh, Mexican bush sage. And I will say Mex the, the African blue basil will will it's blooming in my garden until frost and so it's there for the those late bumblebees when that and the asters the aromatic asters and nothing else is there much and then you want to think about the caterpillars this, some people call these um, parsley worms the caterpillars of the black swallowtail and you need to just plant on a pot parsley for them too. Usually, I've had them eat it down and it'll come back. But 
they need they need the the food too. And I really think that pesticides and beneficials don't mix. And you don't want to be using, you know, you eating these herbs, you don't need to home gardeners don't need, need to eat, use much pesticides at all. And even quote organic pesticides can be very harmful to a lot of pollinators, to bees especially. Lots of the native bees. So or observe your own garden, experiment, see what works. And, and, and keep your eyes open. You'd be amazed that we, we often just see the flowers and don't take a minute to really concentrate on the, the little insects that might be there, the little bees, the, the ladybugs. But besides the, the good they do, the, the herbs are just beautiful. In fact, um, I think it was um, Jim Wilson, who used to be on the Victory Garden, you may remember, used to say that so in one of his books, he said that, that so many herbs had been grown so long in the perennial section, we've forgotten their herbs. Well, this is this, this catnip was the perennial plant of the year, but we use the garden, we use herbs with our vegetables and so many with flowers. Yarrow, coriasis, salvia, and you'll, you'll notice a lot of these pictures will have an insect on them. Another one of that African blue basil. The Mexican bush sage, which dries wonderfully and just looks pretty much like that. Pineapple sage, which hummingbirds like. Do you know there are 700 different salvias? You can make a tea out of them, pineapple sage too. The oreganos, the, the monardas, bee bombs, so many different kinds of thyme. And you see all the variegation here. Uh, Jim Wilson also said that there were, that herbs had more gray plants than any other group of plants. So you see, um, the Santalina and Artemisia, um, lamb's ear. Um, the one on the right is Southern Wood, which is an Artemisia too. But. And, and, and then the herbs with the, the blue gray colors. And so many people now are using thymes as ground covers. They'd ever cook with all that thyme make wonderful herbs make wonderful ground covers and edgings and then i want to say just a little about native herbs there's so many um, herbs that are con wildflowers and native plants that are considered herbs uh, you know witch hazel has been used in cosmetics for the skin for years spice bush uh, actually the spice people used as a spice. Uh, a friend of mine had collected some one year and used it in a pound cake and, and a, an elderly friend of her mother's came over and she served her piece and she said, that tastes like just what my mother used to make. So people had been using it like, kind of like all spice. But it's a, and of course it's a host plant for um, spice bush swallowtails. And these these great blue lobia you've you've probably seen golden seal and you know ginseng is also um, a wild herb and and Appalachian sustainable development around here is encouraging people to grow these forest botanicals because they were used as as um, they, they are, they were used as medicine, they are used as medicine all around the world, but now. Mountain mints are, are wonderful. Not only um, are, they, are they fun to use to make tea, but they are wonderful um, pollinator plants. And then you, you may have seen passion flower, even the health food store, the, but these are all wild herbs. So if you 
plant an herb garden, you can grow a better world. You can make your world better. I mean, there's, there's just so much to offer uh, in, in your yard, both as, as food and, and just enjoyment. So are there any questions? I think we kind of answered most of the questions as we went along, which was really good. 